All right, so I just wanted to give you guys a little tutorial on how you can go about formatting your project that you're working on for week 10. So this project doesn't have to be very long. Um, your presentation is a short presentation. So you want to pick some commercial product out there that you want to show either measures up to its hype and its claims or doesn't measure up. And in that measuring up, you have to use chemistry in some way, shape, or form, something that you've learned over the course of this year to um, help you detect the baloney that's going on in their marketing. Okay, so um, I'd like to introduce you to Carl Sagan's uh, baloney detection kit and kind of the things that you can look for when you're looking at marketing schemes about different products. Carl Sagan just briefly was an American astronomer, and you may have seen some of his episodes growing up called The Cosmos, and he really advocated for scientific skeptical inquiry and the scientific method in everyday life and trying to, you know, discern what, what's a good buy or what's good products or, or what out there is uh, really going to help you. So he, he built what he called the fine art of baloney detection. And so through their training, scientists are equipped with what Carl Sagan calls the baloney detection kit, which is a set of cognitive tools and techniques that help fortify your mind against penetration by falsehoods. Okay, and there are nine major tools then that you can use to go about testing what the claims are for different products when you're looking uh, to purchase something. So the first one is independent confirmation. Wherever possible, there has to be independent confirmation of the facts um, that the marketing team is putting out there that they say their product does. So you might see somewhere out there that peach pits or apricot pits can cure cancer. And so you would want to go and say, well, is there independent confirmation of this? Or is it just the place that's selling those peach pits? Right? So commercial sources that promote the consumption of these raw apricot kernels recommend 6 to 10 kernels per day. But this actually can be dangerous. So the CDC notes that apricot seeds have substantial amounts of chemicals which are metabolized into cyanide, which we know is poisonous and toxic to the human body. So the research that's out there suggests that 0.5 to 3.5 milligrams of cyanide per kilogram body weight can be lethal. And so potentially safe levels would be maybe three small kernels for adults and less than one for a toddler if you're actually consuming apricot kernels or peach pits. So this probably is not a good idea or a good recommendation for trying to treat something like cancer, right? And so this just gets at the toxicity, but doesn't get to um, what it's doing for cancer, right? Does it, is it helpful at all, right? So you have to have some sort of independent confirmation. So when you're looking at independent confirmation, first you want to be careful about the dates. Are the reports up to date? Right? So you don't want to use really old material that hasn't been tested in a long time. You want to check your sources as well. Are they health professionals creating or reviewing information? And where is it coming from? You don't want to just look at blog sites from who knows where. Right? You want to be looking at actual publications from places like the CDC um, or that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, this type of thing. And then double check. Visit multiple sites and compare the information. And then finally, if you're actually going to try using a dietary supplement, you should check with your doctor. The second point is that all points of view should be represented. So you want to encourage substantive debate on the evidence by knowledgeable proponents of all points of view. Right? And so you and your lab partner should be really investigating all the different uh, areas around your specific topic, whatever it is that you choose, and have good discussions about it. What do you think the evidence is, is saying about this? 
and what are the experts saying? Number three, watch out about arguments from authority. They actually carry very little weight. Authorities have made mistakes in the past and they will do so in the future. For example, when radium was discovered in the, in the 1920s, both doctors and other lay people like were very quick to declare that this was the new source of youth and they started selling radium water for people to drink. And obviously that was not a good thing. We now know that radioactive materials can be very damaging and in fact cause cancer. So um, you have to be careful out there. What things are we doing that is our current radium water, right? Those things are still out there. So you also want to make sure that you're spinning more than one hypothesis. The marketing team has their hypothesis but there might be alternative reasons for seeing an activity, right? So if something needs to be explained, try to think of all the different ways in which it could be explained, and then look at the evidence that can support those hypotheses. For example, uh, there was a case of very weak electromagnetic fields being found to recover immune loss that occurs with aging when humans are exposed to these pulsed magnetic fields. So, well, how does this occur? So if you're trying to read up about a technique like this and say, well, is the evidence really out there that this is a good thing to start doing with people? Um, so find out what the experts are talking about and how do they think that these processes are going on. The next thing as a scientist, you wanna try not to get overly attached to a hypothesis just because it's yours. Um, we do tend to get very attached to the things that we work on, especially if we spend years doing it. So you want to make sure that you're not biasing yourself or your data or your results um, when you're getting them because you like a certain hypothesis and you really want to support that with your data. Right? You have to try to come at any question with a really open mind and uh, see if you can compare it with any alternative hypotheses and find any reasons for rejecting it. Quantification is also pretty important. So you want to have effects of the data in a quantifiable format. Can you put numbers to that? Is there a measure of this? When we can use actual numbers, when we're talking about data and we have some statistical analysis, that's going to lend a lot more support for the credibility of the discovery or the conclusions that are being made. So if you have a chain of arguments, every link in that chain has to work, including the premise, not just most of them. So for example, there was a vodka ad in which a giant bottle of vodka is shown being poured onto a sleepy village and it transforms it into a glittering city with skyscrapers. So the message that's conveyed by this picture expresses this following argument. You have an explicit premise. If you add vodka to your life, your sleepy life will be transformed into a life of cosmopolitan excitement. You have an implicit premise. A life of cosmopolitan excitement is desirable. And then the conclusion, you should add vodka to your life. So purchase vodka. Right, so do these actually really hold true? Also beware of Occam's razor. So this is a convenient rule of thumb that urges us when faced with two hypotheses that explain the data equally well, choose the simpler hypothesis. So if you have a patient, for example, that's complaining of headache, neck stiffness, fever, and confusion, it's of course perfectly possible that he simultaneously developed a subarachnoid hemorrhage, torticollis, and hepatic encephalopathy. However, Occam's razor offers us a single diagnosis that fully accounts for this single presentation and guides us to a diagnosis of meningitis. So that explanation requires the fewest number of assumptions and is more likely the correct outcome. So you also have to ask, can the hypothesis be falsified if it's not falsifiable, then it's not really a worthwhile hypothesis, right? So consider the idea that the Earth is a single living organism, the Gaia hypothesis. 
can we actually disprove that? Or can it be tested in any reasonable way? If not, we can't really draw conclusions about it. Also look for testing and retesting of hypotheses. Inveterate skeptics must be given the chance to follow your reasoning, duplicate experiments, and see if they get the same results. So if you are going to, again, take a dietary supplement or buy a product that you want to do something, um, you want to be sure that it's been tested over and over by independent resources and that they get the same results. So when you're trying to detect the baloney that's out there, you also want to avoid 20 common fallacies. And so I'll go over those really quickly as well. Ad hominem. This is Latin for to the man. So this attacks the arguer and not the argument. So I heard we can't trust the AstraZeneca vaccine because that company is aligned with the eugenics movement. This would be an example of an ad hominem attack because it's focusing on the company making the vaccine instead of the vaccine safety itself. We already uh, briefly touched on this is argument from, a, argument from authority. We said that authorities can often be wrong. We had that example of the radium water. So if a person making the claim is presented as an expert, who should be trusted when his or her expertise is not in the area being discussed, uh, you have to be careful. So I saw some dietary supplements uh, that were being posted by a podiatrist, and I was like, what? <laughs> How does the podiatrist uh, able to evaluate and recommend these dietary supplements that have nothing to do with the feet? All right, so you also want to uh, beware of arguments from adverse consequences. So this would involve concluding that an idea or a proposition is true or false because the consequence of it being true or false are desirable or undesirable. So the fallacy lies in the fact that the desirability is not related to the truth value of the idea or the proposition. So there was a, a thing called subluxation that uh, chiropractors uh, were promoting as a thing. And medically, we couldn't actually see that this was a, a real thing, right? But there were posters out there that were suggesting that this subluxation uh, was a real silent killer and that the chiropractors were needed to help fix this problem with the spine. Um, but there's no evidence that uh, these conditions actually truly exist or can cause death or disease within the human body. Next, we have appeal to ignorance. This is a claim that whatever has not been proved false must be true, or vice versa. So something like, I heard we don't know about the long-term side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine. This is an example of an appeal to ignorance because it focuses on what is not known. Because COVID-19 vaccines have not been used for years, this idea is used to sow doubt by suggesting that we don't know what will happen years after getting vaccinated. When addressing appeals to ignorance, it's important to focus on what we do know. So in the case of COVID-19 vaccines, we know that the vaccines are processed quickly. They do not remain in the body for indeterminate amounts of time. We also know that historically, when vaccines have caused severe adverse effects, They've occurred within the first two months after vaccination. So millions of people have been vaccinated longer than two months ago without incident at this point, and it's reducing death rates. You also have to be careful of special pleading. So this would be an example of special pleading. So if, like say, an integrative practitioner provides you with an alternative therapy and notes that it works very well, However, it doesn't work for you and you come back and say, hey, it didn't work for me. Your provider comes back and says, well, it didn't work for you because you were skeptical about the treatment. You have to fully believe in the treatment for it to work. This would be an example of special pleading. You also have to beware of begging the question or assuming the answer. This leads to things like circular reasoning. So if I say fruits and vegetables are part of a healthy diet, after all, healthy eating plans include fruits and vegetables. 
this doesn't really tell me why they're important to have in my diet. This is an example of circular reasoning. You know, you've got to get to the reasoning why those fruits and vegetables are having a positive impact on health. You also have to be careful of observational selection. This is also called the enumeration of favorable circumstances, right? So uh, an example of this is the belief that natural things are simply better for us. You see this a lot. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of different things that say this is all natural so that it will be better for you, right? But there's a lot of things that are all natural that are really not good for you. So you could have all natural, organic, gluten-free, box jellyfish venom, right? That's not going to be good for you. Or you could have highly pure mercury that's all natural, and that's also not going to be good for you. Or you could say, hey, opium comes from poppy plants. Poppy plants are natural, so this should be fine. But we know that opium can cause addiction and can really deteriorate our health. So you've got to be careful, especially when you have advertisements that suggest that natural is just better. You also have to be careful of statistics of small numbers. These can give you very skewed observational results that aren't going to hold on average. So if we have very small statistical numbers, we could claim both of these things as being true. The U.S. counties with the lowest rates of kidney cancer are mostly rural, sparsely populated, located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest and the South and the West. We could also say the U.S. counties with the highest rates of kidney cancer are mostly rural, sparsely populated, located in traditionally Republican states in the Midwest. So this would be drawing conclusions uh, from statistics of very small numbers. So if you see something that's sparsely populated, this gives statistics that are built on small numbers of the samples that are taken, and you can get extreme outcomes. Uh, so you're likely to have more variability when you have uh, statistics that use only small numbers. You'll also have to be careful about misunderstanding the nature of statistics. Right, so President Dwight Eisenhower expressed astonishment and alarm on discovering that fully half of all Americans have below average intelligence. But if average is 50%, that means 50% are above that and 50% are below that. Right, so that's not really a striking or astonishing discovery. You also have to look for inconsistency. So two distinct beliefs that are promoted but are inconsistent with one another. For example, uh, as the American society, we typically will prudently plan for the worst of which a potential military adversary is capable of, but we thriftily will ignore scientific projections on the environmental dangers of climate change because they're not proved, right? So um, we are very inconsistent in the way we deal with problems. You also have to be careful of non sequiturs. So this is a good example. So the conclusion does not always have to follow from the premise. People died of cancer before cigarettes were invented, so smoking doesn't cause cancer. That would be an example of a non sequitur. There's also post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means it happened after, so it was caused by. We have a lot of things that are correlated with one another, but correlation does not always mean causation. So a few years back, autism was linked with the timing of certain vaccinations. And so it was thought that uh, some of the preservatives, the timerazole that was causing the autism in the children, but this actually wasn't the case, and larger studies needed to be done of unvaccinated children to show that they had the same autism rates as vaccinated children. So it just happened that autism shows up around the same time that this vaccination is given. And uh, so it's, it's correlated in time, but it's not a causative link. So you have to be really careful of these types of things as well. You also can see meaningless questions, asking a question that doesn't have any rational meaning. 
What happens when an irresistible force meets an immovable object? If there's such a thing as an irresistible force, then there can be no immovable objects and vice versa. You also have to watch for excluded middle, right? So sometimes it looks like things are black and white and it's either one way or the other way. And this can produce a false dichotomy, right? So you, you want to um, have that distribution. You don't want to only take into account the extremes in a continuum. So there might be an intermediate possibility, right? So be careful of extreme positions. You also have to be careful of short-term versus long-term effects. And this is actually a subset of that excluded middle. Um, so, for example, this can happen in budgeting and things like that. Uh, so if we can't afford programs to feed malnourished children and educate preschool kids, uh, then why can we afford to explore space or pursue fundamental science uh, if we have such a huge deficit? Right, so these are just two different things that are going on concurrently with each other, um, but maybe you know they they don't you don't take into account that middle ground. You also have to be careful of the slippery slope, and this is also related to the excluded middle. Uh, so things like if we legalize marijuana now, then we'll legalize all other drugs, and then crime will increase. So this is an example of a slippery slope that one thing is going to necessarily lead to another thing when there's really not data to show that. And then we talked a little bit about uh, confusing correlation and causation uh, when we were talking about the autism and uh, vaccination uh, correlation. Right? You can also do this in the reverse way as well when something is causative in nature you can say, oh, it's just correlated, but it's not meaningful, right? And so uh, cigarette smoking, this was um, highly correlated with lung cancer death. You can see the graph over here. But for a long time, the tobacco companies uh, said, oh, this is just a correlation. It's not causative. The cigarettes aren't causing the lung cancer. So this was an argument that was used for a very long time. Uh, so that the tobacco industry did not have to put warnings on their cigarette packages. You also have to be careful about the straw man. And so in this kind of argument, this would be character, caricaturing a position to make it easier to attack. So you might say the pharmaceutical industry is systematically sabotaging alternative medicine because it would lose substantial amounts of revenue if the true value of alternative medicine were to become general knowledge. So you could use this as an argument to support using alternative medicines, right? And to say that they're just as good as the things that the pharmaceutical companies are coming up with to treat disease. And oftentimes that this is not true. You have to look at the specific alternative medicine and see if it does have any value that's been researched and shown to have substantive effect for that condition, right? So this is a straw man argument. So you have to be careful about those. And then uh, some companies in their marketing will suppress evidence, right? Or they'll only tell half truths or they'll cherry pick their data. So they do this to help support their position. So we have seen evidence of the coal, asbestos, nuclear fuel, and tobacco industries all knowingly suppress evidence regarding the health hazards uh, of their industries to their employees. Right? So this can be a real problem. And then also looking for weasel words, using alternative words to get around constraints. Um, so words like promotes, leading scientists agree, Four out of five dentists agree. Um, all these types of weasel words get around uh, listing specific data or a statistical analysis that actually shows that the treatment is actually working. So you want to be careful about the use of weasel words when you're looking at your advertisements in whatever you choose for your project. So how do you go about choosing your topic? 
honestly, your topic can be about anything. It doesn't have to be on a natural product. It doesn't have to be on a food product or something that's consumed. Uh, you could. There's a lot of stuff out there. It just has to deal with something that is chemical in nature, um, and you can use some of what you've learned about chemistry to help you ferret out whether or not the advertisements are being um, truthful in what they say, right? So there's a lot of arguments, for example, out there that lithium batteries cause more uh, harm to the environment than using gasoline, right? So maybe you want to say, well, is that true or not? You know, how can I investigate that and show scientifically uh, whether that's the case or not? So that would be a good project. Um, and then, you know, you could just like walk into Safeway and go down their um, vitamins aisle and there is a ton of stuff down there. Uh, you can look on Amazon.com uh, at products. All right. So that is just a little introduction about uh, some of the things, you know, to look for. Um, I could show you like a, an example. All right, so here would be a good example of something that you could choose for a project, right? The, the health benefits of pink Himalayan salt, right? Here you've got this advertisement here that's giving you 20 different health benefits of using this salt over normal regular salt. Um, so contains 80 minerals and elements, helps control water levels in the body and balance electrolytes, promotes stable pH levels, boost brain health, helps regulate blood sugar, anti-aging, boost energy. Um, it's got all of these things in here. Is any of this true? Has any of this been shown? And is it better than just consuming regular iodized salt? Okay, so this would be a nice uh, project that you and your lab partner could work on. And there's hundreds of other things out there uh, that, that uh, you could pick. So, yeah, if you have other questions, please feel free to ask any of your professors for this class as you guys are preparing your talks uh, for week 10. All right.